Welcome to this latest edition of FBI Faith-Based Investigation. I'm Michael Voris. I'm standing here right in front of the largest Masonic temple in the world. It's located in the Archdiocese of Detroit and opened in 1926, just a few years before the Great Depression hit the United States. It's a meeting place for the group that we'll be focusing on in this episode of FBI, the Freemasons. This 14-story Gothic-style building is quite spectacular an interior that has 1,000, get this, 1,037 rooms and a whopping 12 million square feet. According to one source, never before or since has so large and complex a temple been built, including the one made famous by King Solomon. Side note, the first U.S. President George Washington was a Freemason, and his own tools were used in a ceremony for placing the cornerstone of this building. However, it should be mentioned that Washington was never an active participant in Freemasonry, and there's some pretty strong evidence that he converted to Catholicism on his deathbed. But back to the building. As you can see, it's truly a striking edifice to behold. But don't be fooled. While Masonic architecture may be beautiful, that's just the exterior. The inside of this organization is a whole different story. Its goals, at the highest levels of the craft, are pure evil. When passing by Masonic Lodges, most people might think to themselves, oh, those Masons seem like pretty good guys. They don don't donate money to hospitals. They do work in the community. They believe in God and the afterlife. And Shriners, oh yeah, those are the guys who wear the funny hats and drive those little cars in parades. Sure, maybe it's a bit secretive, but hey, it's just a bunch of hardworking guys who want to have a boys club in their free time. No harm. This is a common misunderstanding, and to be honest, how most Freemasons think of themselves and their organization. But if you look closely at the teachings of the craft, they are subtly deceitful. And of course, once you reach the elite, the very highest levels of Masonry, you'll learn what they hide from all the lower ranks. And it's something darker and more insidious than you could imagine. Freemasonry on this episode of FBI. We've all heard various conspiracy theories, seen pictures of the paranoid fidgety guy wearing the ridiculous tinfoil hat to prevent mind control by the government, or there's the paranoid guy that's constantly looking behind him, being followed by an ultra-secret police force. Do mentally unstable people like this exist? Well, certainly, but as Joseph Heller said in his novel Catch-22, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they aren't after you. When judging out of the mainstream claims, you simply follow the evidence wherever it leads. Same thing with our topic today. All the information we're presenting on Freemasonry is, well, as is attributed to an old TV detective, just the facts. There are no theories here, just quotes straight from the mouths of involved parties, information gleaned from the documents of involved organizations. Papal documents, no black helicopters, no UFOs, just the facts. It's helpful to lay out some of the terminology we'll be using throughout the show, so we're all on the same page.
To start, the organization is known by a few names. Freemasonry, the shortened version, which is simply Masonry. They're also known as the Craft or the Lodge. All these names, all four of them are used interchangeably. The word Mason comes from the Latin Matio, meaning a builder of walls or a stone cutter. Now, someone who belongs to Freemasonry is called a Freemason, or simply a Mason. Another commonly known name is a Shriner, which is a high-level Mason. Not all Masons rise to the level of Shriners, but all Shriners are Masons. Now, within Masonry, there are different degrees. Entered Apprentice, Fellow Craft, and Master Mason. After a Mason reaches the third level, which is Master Mason, he can then choose to follow either the Scottish Rite or the York Rite. Within each rite, there are various steps or progressions that a Mason may ascend. Now, there are other rites within the Lodge, but these are the two main rites. In this show, we'll be concentrating on the Scottish Rite, which is the most common in the United States. The Scottish Rite has 33 degrees or steps. Now, masonry doesn't consider these to be steps, which it calls degrees in the same sense of the first three that we just saw, Entered Apprentice, Fellow Craft, and Master Mason. These degrees, which Masons call light degrees, meaning they are becoming more illumined, are more like honors the Mason receives as he progresses within the Lodge. The basic Masonic organization is called a Lodge. The organization is called the Lodge, which is subjected to a Grand Lodge. So, for example, in Detroit, we might have, let's say, the Detroit No. 2 Lodge, which is subject to the Grand Lodge of Michigan. The lodges are not the same as the temples. While the temple is the physical building where the Masons gather, the lodge is the hierarchical structure. One of the quotes we started with the show was from Pope Leo XIII's encyclical Humanum Genus on Freemasonry. The Holy Father penned the church's definitive statement against the craft back in 1884 to warn the Catholic faithful about the dangers of this seemingly innocent group. Many Catholics were joining the Masons back then, unaware of what they really stood for. Unfortunately, Catholics are still joining the group today for social reasons or to network and make business connections, not knowing the kind of danger to which they're exposing their souls. Pope Leo instructed the faithful to tear away the mask of Freemasonry. And tear away we shall. But before we do that, let's learn about the organization and some of its basic history. So what exactly is Freemasonry? Well, before we answer that, it's important to say that Freemasons are usually not upfront about their organization, and there is a great deal of confusion. This is not only common, but it's actually promoted. It's almost as if Masonry had a skillful PR department that makes sure to confuse and deceive. For example, if you ask a member of the craft, hey, what is Freemasonry? You'll probably get an answer like, well, it's a worldwide fraternal organization that requires a belief in a supreme being as criteria for membership and maintains a certain level of secrecy. The Freemason will also point out to you that Masonry devotes itself to charity and philanthropy, like we see represented here in this Shriners statue. So, is that definition wrong? Well, according to former Freemason John Salza, yes it is. Mr. Salza is an attorney and renowned Catholic apologist, but more than that, he is a former Mason who left the craft when he discovered the incompatibility between Masonry and his Catholic faith. According to him, It has all of the elements of religion. Uh, for example, Freemasonry has its own names for God. It has its own symbols for God. It has its own names for heaven. It has its own symbols for heaven. It has its own theology. Uh, it has its own doctrines, which it provides in its own Bible, the Masonic Bible. It has its own rituals, secret rituals, uh, that exemplify these doctrines. It has its uh, an altar. It has vestments. It has feast days. It has consecration rites. So it has all of the elements of organized religion. And in fact, Freemasonry is a more organized religion than, than many religions that claim they are, for example, even Protestant religion. So it is clearly a religion, um, but the issue really is the, the label is not relevant. It doesn't matter what Freemasonry calls itself. Some modern-day Masons say, you know, we're, we're religious, but we're not a religion. 
Well, that is like saying that a man is intellectual, but he has no intellect. I mean, it is a ridiculous assertion, but the bottom line, I tell the Masons, our opponents, that you can call yourself whatever you want. You can say you're a fraternity. You can say you're a social club. It doesn't matter. The label's irrelevant. The fact of the matter is you teach doctrines that are contrary to Christianity. There is no fraternity exception for teaching error that leads souls to perdition. If we look at how Masonry is defined by its own authors, it's easy to see that it's not a mere fraternity. Let's take a look at some of the definitions. The definitions of Freemasonry have been numerous, but they all unite in declaring it to be a system of morality, by the practice of which its members may advance their spiritual interest and mount by the theological lodge on earth to the lodge in heaven. It is a science which is engaged in the search after divine truth and which employs symbolism as its method of instruction. These are most likely definitions you won't get from a Mason today. As a matter of fact, in our research, we've asked Masons to define their organization and the ones we spoke to, well, they didn't really know what it is. To most people, Freemasonry is just an after-work club where they go to hang out with their buddies and sometimes they'll volunteer at a soup kitchen or host a local fundraiser, stuff like that. So just as there are Catholics who don't bother to understand Catholicism, in fact, most Catholics, unfortunately, there are Masons who do not know about Masonry. But that doesn't change what it is. Bottom line, the best way to understand Freemasonry is by understanding what it is not. And as we've said, it is not just a fraternity, but a worldwide organization with its own agenda and own belief system which opposes the Catholic Church. Masons might deny that Freemasonry has a fixed set of beliefs or creed, but if we turn to their own highly recommended and celebrated authors, we get quotes like this. Although Freemasonry is not a dogmatic theology and is tolerant in the admission of man of every religious faith, it would be wrong to suppose that it is without a creed. Masonry's creed is expressed in two ways, by their written and their unwritten laws. The written laws are universal rituals found in their Book of Constitutions and practiced by Masons in their lodges around the world. The unwritten laws are called landmarks. Here's John Salza to explain more about these landmarks. Landmarks are really considered to be the oral tradition, if you will, of Freemasonry. There's no one universal set of landmarks. There are some variations, but essentially the landmarks are the same and that Freemasons must believe in a deity. It doesn't matter what God they believe in, they just believe in a supreme being. Uh, they must believe in uh, secrecy, that the rituals are secret, and they communicate these truths of their religion in ritual, and they must believe in, in, in a life, an eternal life, and that is gained through the practice of Masonic uh, virtue, basically a works-based salvation. Uh, another landmark would be the oaths of covenant secrecy that the Masons swear to the Lodge never to reveal uh, their doctrines. Another landmark is the use of these symbols from the operative stonemasons. For example, the square, the level, the plump, the plump, the trowel. You know, these are symbols that communicate basic Masonic doctrines and principles and truths. Freemasonry not only has its own creed, but other religious elements to it, like their own liturgy expressed by pagan rituals and oaths. They also have, get this, prayers, vestments, temples, weekly gatherings, and celebrants whom they call worshipful masters. Some authors, like Freemason Albert Mackey, state that although Freemasonry is not a religion, it is a religious organization, while other authors, like Freemason Albert Pike, say that Masonry is not a religion or a religious organization, but has elements of a religion. Now, whether Freemasonry is or is not a religion seems to be debatable, but the bottom line is it doesn't matter whether it is or isn't a religion. Whether we call it a fraternity or a social club, what matters is that it teaches heresy and it is directly opposed to the One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. Masonry also has its own goals, which most Masons will say are charitable activities, but their leading minds take it a step further. 
It is neither charity nor almsgiving, nor the cultivation of the social sentiment, for both of these are merely incidental to its organization, but it is the search after truth. We've said in the beginning of the show that we would only use reliable sources to portray masonry as it is. And in order to do so, we went through Masonic archives and found reliable and trustworthy authors such as Henry Coyle, Albert Pike, and Albert Mackey. As a former Mason, John Salza has something to say about them. But it is important to note that these authors are considered some of the highest authorities of Freemasonry and all of the Grand Lodges in the United States, and this is important, they recommend to their Masons these books. And so when non-Masons, opponents like me, bring up these books to prove that Mason, Masonry claims it's a religion, the Masons, of course, will say, well, they're not our authorities, okay? But then, on the other hand, their own Grand Lodges recommend these books as titles to be read by their Masons in their jurisdiction. So you see the hypocrisy there. But again, it ultimately doesn't matter what people try to, to label Freemasonry. The fact is it has all the elements of religion, and this is why the church has condemned it. As Salza said, these authors are recognized by Grand Lodges themselves as essential and recommended Masonic literature. If you hear Mason saying he has never heard of these guys, well, he should have. That's like saying you're a Catholic, but you've never heard of St. Peter or St. Paul. So whether an individual Mason knows or reads these authors, that's irrelevant. A very common question when it comes to Masonry is, who is the final authority, the final authority when it comes to the craft? Unlike Catholicism, Masonry does not have an ultimate authority, a pope if you will. The final authority of the craft rests in the ironclad tradition of their rituals. Those rituals are collected together in the Book of Constitutions compiled in 1717, which we'll discuss a little later, a little later on in the program. the centuries, Masonry developed two paths that eventually joined together. The first path, operative Freemasonry, concerned itself with physical buildings. We see that the early guilds of stonemasons were responsible for constructing some of the great medieval European cathedrals. The second path, speculative Freemasonry, con concerned itself with the building of the spiritual and philosophical temple of the soul. Albert Mackey, the Masonic authority we mentioned earlier, claims that Freemasonry began with the builders of King Solomon's temple, dating back to at least the 9th century BC. According to Mackey, the union between Gentile builders and Jewish culture created what may be considered as, in his words, quote, the immediate prototype of the present institution, close quote. This combined the pagan culture of the Gentiles with the Jewish culture, creating a hybrid organization. It was an amalgam of builders and religious leaders, which is operative and speculative Freemasonry joined together. Now, it's important to underline that while Mackey is a respected Masonic source, there are many other versions of how Masonry began. Some say it actually dates back even further to the time of Noah, while others say that the British military and political leader Oliver Cromwell invented the craft's biblical origins out of thin air. Ultimately, we know that the Masons built the medieval cathedrals, so their history certainly goes back that far, but we don't know if the craft actually goes back to biblical times or not. The organization continued to evolve following the construction of Europe's great cathedrals. Masons perfected their manual labor skills as builders, while at the same time, their rituals and oaths were being shaped in the process. The next notable occurrence takes place in York, England, in 926 AD, a general assembly was convened by Prince Edwin. Now keep in mind, this isn't the masonry we see today. However, this is the point when their annual assemblies began. It also represents an embryonic version of the union of Freemasonry almost 800 years later. 
Now, in 1390, the Regius Manuscript was written. This is the oldest known Masonic document and is best described as a poem of moral duties. The first sign of distrust of the craft comes in 1425, when King Henry VI creates an act against Masonry's annual meetings, and a century later, Queen Elizabeth I sent an army to break up their meeting. Now, after the Protestant Revolt in 1517, when the demand for cathedrals was down, Freemasons started to allow non-Masons into their ranks to help increase their dwindling numbers. These men were known as accepted Masons and included all kinds of men like bankers and merchants and others. This triggers the gradual weakening of the operative side of Masonry and strengthens the speculative side. They were less and less concerned about physical buildings and more and more concerned about their rituals and philosophy. So much so that Masons created what were called the Shaw Statutes, which were a sketch of how a journey from apprentice to Master Mason occurred. Now it's believed that the malicious goal of destroying Christianity, and especially Catholicism, was first put forth in 1547 at a conference of heretics in Vincenza. The person responsible for this idea was a man by the name of Lelio Sozzini. He was an Italian Renaissance humanist and an anti-Trinitarian reformer. This is the same man who was essentially responsible for the heresy of Unitarianism. After Sozzini's death, his nephew Fausto picked up the anti-Christian ball and ran with it. Young Fausto and his friends' goals were not just to destroy Christ's church, but to replace it with another temple where any heterodox idea or supporter was welcome. When the government of Venice became aware of their plans, Fausto and his friends fled. This is when the anti-Christian ideology found its way into Freemasonry. Incidentally, this fact of Sozzini seeking to destroy Christianity and Catholicism comes from a rather unique source, a work called Grand Orient Freemasonry Unmasked by Monsignor George Dillon. The level of trust we can put in this work is almost on par with a papal encyclical. As the story goes, Monsignor Dillon wrote the work in response to the charge from Pope Leo XIII's Humanum Janus, his encyclical, asking the faithful to unmask Freemasonry. Monsignor Dillon wrote his work about six months after the encyclical was released and presented it in person to the Holy Father, to Pope Leo. Pope Leo liked it so much that he paid for it to be translated into Italian and to be published. That's not a stamp of approval. We don't know what is. However, the Masons didn't officially change over to a speculative organization until June 24th, 1717. Remember that date, when four existing branches from southern England met at the Goose and Gridiron Restaurant in Westminster, an area in central London. It was out of this meeting that the first Grand Lodge was formed and Freemasonry as we know it today. Now, as a quick aside, it's said that another group joined with the Masons on this day called the Knights of the Rose Croix, or Rosicrucians. This was a group which, was believed in, which believed in strange mystic philosophies and alchemy. The Rosicrucians were not well respected, but they had wealth to bring to the table. The two main figures who were responsible for this unification of the lodges in 1717 were Jean Theophile de Agouille and James Anderson, two Protestant ministers. In 1723, Anderson published the Book of the Constitutions of Free and Accepted Masons, unifying the craft under one rule of law. It should be noted that a few lodges disagreed with the changes that the newly formed Grand Lodge of 1717 made to the Masonic rituals. These lodges banded together to form the ancient Grand Lodge of England. The two lodges, the ancients and the moderns as they were known, were rivals until they joined together a century later to form the United Grand Lodge of England. Their headquarters is Freemasons Hall in downtown London where they've been meeting since 1775. There have actually been three Masonic buildings on the site with the current one behind me opening up in 1933. Now after the 1717 meeting, Freemasonry spread quickly throughout Europe. First in France in 1725 in Paris, followed by Ireland in 1729, then to Spain in approximately 1730, 
Next came Italy in Florence in 1731, followed by Sweden in 1735. Both Scotland and Germany had their Freemason lodges set up in 1736. By 1738, Pope Clement XII had grown concerned about the rapid expansion of Freemasonry with its required blasphemous oath, so he issued the Church's first condemnation, a papal bull in Emanati Apostolatus. Masonry is then introduced to Austria and Poland in 1742 and Denmark in 1743. We then moved to the Netherlands where their Grand Lodge was founded in 1756. One of the ex explanations for this rapid spread of Masonry throughout Christian Europe is that during this period the Catholic Church lost a lot of masculinity. Important elements of the Church, such as the sense of duty and self-sacrifice, had become weakened and men found in Freemasonry the answer to this lack of masculinity in the Church. Now just to give you some historical context, all of this is taking place during the Enlightenment, a movement of European intellectuals led by Voltaire, himself a Freemason and a Frenchman. The Enlightenment wanted to reshape society, moving away from religious principles such as faith, revelation, and tradition, as enunciated by the Catholic Church, and concentrate instead exclusively on science and reason. So it's in the midst of this revolution, revolution of thought that the modern Grand Lodge of England is formed. This is where today's Masonic ceremonies and rituals came from, along with the three basic degrees we mentioned earlier, Apprentice, Fellowcraft, and Master Mason. It's interesting to note that prior to the formation of the Grand Lodge in England, Freemasonry was a Christian organization. Proof of this can be found in prayers to the Blessed Trinity that they used in the late 1600s. Once the Grand Lodge was formed, however, there was a split with the ancients retaining their belief in Christianity, while the moderns chose a more progressive belief system. The two lodges fought for dominance until they eventually merged to form the United Grand Lodge of England on November 25, 1813. By the 1730s, however, Masonry had crossed the pond and established lodges in Philadelphia and Boston. About ten years later, a new dark philosophy called Illuminism was introduced to the world. Illuminism was concocted by the philosopher Jacques de Levron, Joachim de la Tour de la Casa Martínez de Pascuale, also known as Martínez de Pascuale. It was then refined by his student Louis-Claude de Saint-Martin. The main goals of Illuminism were the introduction of pantheism, which is a form of atheism, the implementation of communism, and finally, the destruction of Catholicism, and eventually all belief in God. All of these evil goals were put into action by the German professor Adam Weishaupt, who formed an organization called the Illuminati in 1776. The Illuminati would eventually work its way into Freemasonry, which we'll discuss shortly. Once the 18th century hit and the Enlightenment philosophy took over, it was out with Catholicism and Christianity and in with reason and a belief in a very generic supreme being. They called him the grand architect of the universe. Whatever religion you believed in, as long as it included faith in a higher power of some sort, you were welcome in Freemasonry. It essentially put all religions on the same level, negating the supremacy of Christ in the Catholic Church. This is called indifferentism, which we'll get to later in the show. Over the past few centuries, the Masons have been deeply involved in many of the wars around the globe, but we'll just be focusing on three of them for the sake of time. The French Revolution began in 1789 and was a time of terrible bloodshed and social upheaval. Many are not aware that the French Revolution was actually planned by the Freemasons, the Illuminati, and others with sympathetic philosophies. Collectively, they were known as the Jacobins, named after the Dominican convent where they met. The initial plans were made for the revolution back in 1782 at the Congress of Wilhelmsbad, a kind of ecumenical council for Freemasonry held in Germany. 
In addition to sketching out their destructive plans for the French Revolution, the union of Freemasonry and the Illuminati was formalized there as well. To put the finishing touches on their plan to overthrow absolute monarchy and Catholicism in France, a second Congress was called. This one was organized by the French Illuminati. Everything was finalized here for the revolution. Of course, we hear about liberty, equality, and fraternity, along with the Declaration of the Rights of Man, as some of the more noteworthy outcomes of the French Revolution, but the maliciousness against the church, that isn't often mentioned. During the Reign of Terror, from September 1793 to July 1794, priests were decapitated, drowned, and killed by angry mobs. Over the course of the revolution, over 20,000 laws were put into place to remove the Catholic Church's substantial authority and give it over to the state. Diplomatic and financial relations with the Holy See came to a halt. All monasteries in France were suppressed, their properties were seized, and monastic vows were suspended. All priests loyal to the Pope were sentenced to 10 years in prison for the crime of fanaticism. The public was to select all priests and bishops from now on. They were now under government supervision and were allowed to marry and divorce, and marriage was now a civil issue. A new civil religion was introduced, patriotism. Education, handled by the church for hundreds of years, was now handled by the state. They even ditched the Gregorian calendar and invented their own, with 10-day weeks and three-week months. This was set up to abolish worship on Sundays. At one point during the revolution, a woman was placed on the high altar of Notre Dame in Paris, representing the goddess of reason, who was now to be worshiped. And the Marquis de Sade promoted abortion for social reasons and as a way of controlling the population. This was the first time that abortion had become socially and medically acceptable, and it suggested that abortion spread in Western society due to de Sade's writings. Lest there be any doubt that the Freemasons were responsible for the French Revolution, Two French politicians openly admitted it. On July 1, 1904, in the Chamber of Deputies, which is the Legislative Assembly of the French Parliament, Marquis de Rassanvo stated, Freemasonry has worked in a hidden but constant manner to prepare the revolution. We are then in complete agreement on the point that Freemasonry was the only author of the revolution. And the applause which I receive from the left, and to which I am little accustomed, proves, gentlemen, that you acknowledge with me that it was masonry which made the revolution. Rissambo's counterpart, Mr. Jamil, responded saying, we do more than acknowledge it, we proclaim it. But the French Revolution wasn't the only rebellion that the Freemasons were behind. Next, the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, which was the cause of Russia becoming atheistic and Marxist communist, was inspired by the Freemasons. The very idea of a Russian revolution came from that country's Masonic lodges. Mackey's Encyclopedia of Masonry states, The first revolution in March 1917 is said to have been inspired and operated from these lodges and all the members of Kerensky's government belonged to them. Alexander Kerensky was the prime minister of the provisional revolutionary government who was incidentally childhood friends with Lenin and also a key figure in paving the way for the October Revolution later in 1917, which installed the Bolsheviks. As a quick aside, when Kerensky died, he was refused a Christian burial by both the Serbian and Russian Orthodox churches because he was a Freemason. We also learned that some of the funding for the Bolshevik, Re Bolshevik Revolution came from a famous Mason, Lord Alfred Milner, who we'll learn more about later in the show. Arsene de Gulevich, an important general who led forces against the Bolsheviks, wrote in his book, Tsarism and the Revolution. In private interviews, I was told that over 21 million rubles were spent by Lord Milner in financing the Russian Revolution. The fact that Freemasons were responsible for the spread of communism in Russia shouldn't come as a surprise. You recall that communism was one of the ideas Illuminati founder Adam Weishaupt wished to spread. Finally, the craft was also behind the Cristero War, which was a civil war that took place in Mexico from 1926 to 1929. 
It happened because those in charge of the country, who just happened to be Freemasons, wanted to continue the anti-clerical spirit of popular Mexican president Benito Juarez of the late 1800s. The conflict was depicted in the movie film For Greater Glory, although it completely failed to mention that the Masons were behind the war. On August 1st, 1926, the government, led by Plutarco Calles, enforced the closure of all Catholic churches throughout the entire country of Mexico. Calles, an atheist and 33rd degree Freemason who believed the church was, quote, the unique cause of all Mexico's misfortunes, end quote, forced priests to take oaths of loyalty to the state. Many priests wound up tortured and murdered in public. There were 4,500 priests serving before the war began. By 1934, only 334 priests remained for the 15 million Catholics in the country. The rest were either exiled or killed. Pope Pius XI issued multiple encyclicals denouncing the anti-clerical persecution and supporting Mexican Catholics. It's estimated that 90,000 people died in the war, 30,000 Cristeros, 55,000 Mexican federal soldiers and workers, and many civilians and Cristero soldiers killed in anti-clerical attacks after the war was over. Surprisingly, Mexico actually lived under the same institutional revolutionary party founded by Calles until July of 2000. Despite the support of President Clinton and Vice President Gore, the party was defeated in the elections due to scandals and divisions between different Masonic obediences. These were just three of many wars that Masons were behind. Now, let's look at how they've affected the United States, from our notable landmarks to our government. As we recently mentioned, Masonry came to America in the 1730s. Less than a century later, the nation's first third party had formed, and its sole purpose was to oppose Freemasonry. It was called the Anti-Masonry Party and was formed by men who feared that the Masons were secretly trying to take over the country. One particular event was pivotal in motivating them to form. The mysterious disappearance of William Morgan, a Freemason from New York. Apparently, Mr. Morgan was unhappy with his lodge and was going to publish a book revealing Masonry's secrets. When his lodge found out, the publishing house was burned down, Morgan simply disappeared, and was presumed murdered. An interesting fact that many aren't aware of, the Statue of Liberty was a gift given to the United States in 1884 from the French Grand Orient Temple Masons to the Masons of America in celebration of the United States' centenary. The statue's official title is Liberty Enlightening the World and was designed by Freemason Frederick August Bertoldi. America has had its fair share of Masons in prominent government roles Nine signers of the Declaration of Independence were Masons. Fourteen presidents have been in the craft, men such as Teddy Roosevelt, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and Gerald Ford were high-ranking Masons, to name a few. Shockingly, President Harry Truman, also a Freemason, once told an audience in Indiana while campaigning for, re for re-election, quote, Although I hold the highest civil office in the world, I have always regarded my rank and title as past Grand Master as the greatest honor that has ever come to me. You cannot campaign for office. It must be bestowed on you through the respect and esteem of the good men who make up the craft. We certainly can't forget founding fathers like Benjamin Franklin and John Hancock who were also in the craft. And in more recent time, Freemasonry also had great influence in our judicial branch of government. Here's John Salza once again. In the 1920s and the 1930s, uh, the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry was very vocal in articulating its desire to separate the church from the state as a matter of public life. <clears throat> and it wrote about this in uh, its periodical uh, called the New Age magazine. That was. Uh, a title was changed to the Scottish Rite Journal in, in the early 90s because of the negative implications the title had. But uh, Masons, including high-ranking Masons, in fact, Hugo Black, who was a Supreme Court Justice at the time, was also advocating this position through the Scottish Rite. I mean, a complete breach of judicial ethics during this period from 1941 to 71 is the Supreme Court being dominated by Freemasons 
and then in unprecedented fashion taking establishment clause cases and, and using the establishment clause which is uh, the amendment to the Constitution which says that the government will not impose a religion on the people using the establishment clause to eliminate religion from the public sphere which was never the intention of the founding fathers and I write about this in my books as well and this doctrine uh, was erected by the Masonic Supreme Court Justice of the United States. We see this in a decision called Everson versus the Board of Education in 1947 and that opened the floodgates. What we see during this reign of Masonic justices on the court is the elimination from, uh, of God from public schools and from all, all phases of life, the elimination of prayer from schools, from Bible reading from schools, from scripture study, the Ten Commandments, public funding of parochial schools, all of this was eliminated in a short period of time under the direction of Freemasons on the court and what has followed, utter depravity in our country. You know, the legalization of sodomy, pornography, abortion, euthanasia, these are all principles of Freemasonry, principles of communism. This idea of separation of church and state was clearly Masonic, having been previously employed by the craft in France, Portugal, and other countries. While Freemasonry only allows men in its ranks, there are numerous other groups that welcome women, children, and minorities as well. We're here in front of the Prince Hall Masonic Temple in Detroit, where one of these sibling groups, Prince Hall Masonry, gathers for its usual meeting. Prince Hall Masonry was formed for African American men all over the United States in 1784 by the man of the same name. Now in Boston, the Order of the Eastern Star was formed in 1850 and is open to both men and women. In September of 1902, the first Masonic Lodge allowing women, called Human Duty, was formed in London by Annie Besant. It is considered irregular by most lodges because of its admittance of women. Less than 20 years later, in 1919, a Masonic group was founded for the Sons of Masons called the Order of de Molay. One of its most famous members is former President Bill Clinton. Job's Daughters and Rainbow Girls, both Masonic-sponsored youth organizations founded for the Daughters of the Masons, were formed a few years later. Now it's important to mention that these groups are also subject to the Catholic Church's condemnation of Freemasonry because that includes not just Freemasonry itself, but all appendant bodies and related bodies to the Lodge. A secret document written by Masons about 200 years ago called The Permanent Instruction of the Alta Vendita is a shocking yet instructive work on how the craft wants to subvert the Catholic Church. While it was intended to be secret, the document fell into the hands of Pope Gregory XVI who verified its authenticity. The document was written and released by the Alta Vendita, which was the highest lodge of the Freemasonic secret society called the Carbonari, who were in charge of all European Freemasonry at the time. In a nutshell, the document says that the craft no longer desires to destroy the church since Masons realized that was not possible. Instead, they sought to infiltrate the church and imbue it with progressive principles. We've named a handful of famous Freemasons so far. There's a few more names you might recognize. The great composer, Mozart. For those of you with a trained ear, you may have noticed small clips being used throughout our program of his opera called The Magic Flute. This may come as something of a surprise, but The Magic Flute is actually an allegory about the Enlightenment veiled in Masonic ritual. French general and dictator Napoleon Bonaparte and America's very own midnight rider Paul Revere. Famous explorers of the Louisiana Territory, Lewis and Clark. Sherlock Holmes author, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Arguably the greatest American author, Mark Twain. 
It is said that Twain eventually resigned from the lodge in 1867. Irish poet and writer Oscar Wilde. In the area of comedy, there was W.C. Fields and Bud Abbott of Abbott and Costello. Circus legends, the Ringling Brothers. And yes, all of the brothers were Masons. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Jazz greats Count Basie and Duke Ellington. Auto giants Henry Ford and Walter Chrysler. James Cash Penny. You may recognize the store he founded, J.C. Penny. Fried Chicken Commander Colonel Sanders. Actors Clark Gable and John Wayne. Magician Harry Houdini. The man of a thousand voices, most notably for Looney Tunes cartoons, Mel Blanc. Astronauts John Glenn and Buzz Aldrin. But it's not just historic figures that were Masons. There are some names from today's celebrities that you'll recognize, like comedians Peter Sellers and Richard Pryor, the actor who played Kramer for NBC's sitcom Seinfeld, Michael Richards, actor Richard Dreyfus, founder of fast food giant Wendy's, the late Dave Thomas, senator and former presidential candidate Bob Dole, retired NFL quarterback John Elway, retired NBA center Shaquille O'Neal, and country musician Brad Paisley. This is just a tiny sampling of the big names. The list goes on and on. Today, the craft can be found all over the world. Masons boast approximately five to six million members worldwide, and of those, around two million are right here in the United States. Now that you know a little bit about the history of Freemasonry, let's look at some of the rituals that you find in your average lodge and what they mean. One of the biggest problems with Freemasonry from the perspective of the Catholic Church is its rituals. In his encyclical Humanum Genus, Pope Leo XIII was very specific in pointing out the heretical nature of these rituals and urging all Catholics to never take part in such pagan ceremonies. To better understand the issues with the Mason doctrine, we're going to break down the initiation ritual. Now, for many years, these rituals were kept secret within Masonry, but fortunately, former Freemasons, many of which are now good Catholics, have come forward and told their stories after leaving the craft, shedding light on the problems. Most young men are solicited to join the Freemasons, especially if they seem to have a promising future. They are persuaded with the idea of professional networking, that through Masonry they will build business connections and get a head start in their careers. Plus, they'll point out the craft involvement in the community. Many cities have signs from Masonic lodges at the city limits, like this one just down the street from our studio. About 200 yards up there is St. Michael's Media and ChurchMilton.tv. All of this makes them seem like part of the fabric of the city. After the candidate is solicited, a couple of Freemasons will pay him a visit. If he has a wife, she will probably be present at this first talk. Although this might seem like a friendly conversation, these Masons are there to attempt to determine if he has any objections or preformed concepts of Masonry that might cause him to be a problem in the future. They'll also ask him what his religion is, taking particular interest in Christians and especially Catholics, because we know that in order to join the Freemasons, you have to believe in God. After that, the candidate is requested to go to the lodge and appear before the master's board, which is a board of 12 master masons that will determine if the candidate is suitable to join Freemasonry. This step is also about getting the feel of the candidate, figuring out what he's about, and once again, seeing if he has any negative opinion on the craft. So they ask their questions and take a vote amongst themselves, which must be unanimous. This is where the phrase blackballed comes from. The voting is done with white balls and black balls. If a candidate receives only one black ball, he is rejected, hence the term blackballed. If there are no problems, the prospect mason will move on to his initiation rite. Right here is where we see the first contradiction. Before he starts the ritual, he is forced to swear he is not there for, quote, mercenary reasons. Well, isn't that strange? After all, masonry is often presented as a bunch of guys helping each other out professionally. That idea is even used to hook new members. 
In the next step, the candidate is requested to strip down to his underwear, removing all personal items. Now, if you're Catholic, that includes crosses, crucifixes, scapulars, and wedding rings, any sacramental that you have to remind yourself of your Catholic faith. Don't you think it's pretty strange for an organization that claims to be compatible with Catholicism to ask its initiates to remove all Catholic symbols? The reason for this is that the candidate is not supposed to have anything defensive or offensive when entering the lodge. This is a very key issue. Now, either your sacramentals are offensive to Freemasonry, and by extension so is your Catholic faith, or they are spiritual defenses against the craft, at which point you're laying down your defenses and becoming vulnerable to evil. Think about that for a second. Now back to our candidate, stripped down to his underwear where he is dressed with Masonic vestments. A noose, called a cable toe, is placed around his neck and he is blindfolded. That sure sounds like fun, huh? All these things are done to, of course, intimidate the candidate, but they also carry a significance within Masonic philosophy. The noose, for example, represents the tie to the profane world. The blindfold represents that the man is in darkness before he is brought into the light of Freemasonry. The aspirant Mason, still blindfolded, is assisted to a door where he has to knock three times before a high-ranked Mason asks him, quote, who comes there? The Mason conducting the candidate answers that he, quote, who has long been in darkness and now seeks to be brought to light. What does that mean? Well, according to Masonic authors, it means not only that all religions are the same, but they are all in darkness, each one of them. It doesn't matter if a man is a baptized Christian who has received the light of Christ. To Freemasonry, he is still in darkness. When entering the lodge, the point of a sharp instrument is pressed against his left breast to give him a painful reminder that he may never reveal the secrets of Freemasonry. The man is then asked to kneel as the worshipful master says a prayer to the Masonic deity, which is not the Holy Trinity. Many Catholics joined Freemasonry under the false impression that the Masonic deity is the same of the Catholic Church, but that is completely dishonest. The Masonic God is called the great architect of the universe, and he is not a personal God who loves humanity and has sent his Son to redeem us. Doesn't matter how much Freemasons might tout that their deity is the same as Catholics, it's just not true. After the prayer, the worshipful master puts his hand on the candidate's head and asks him, quote, In whom do you put your trust? And as long as the candidate answers the name of a deity, the master mason is going to reply, Your trust being in God, your faith is well founded. Arise, follow your conductor, and fear no danger. Now, from a Catholic perspective, there's only one answer to the question, in whom do you put your trust, and that is Jesus Christ. In him I put all my trust. But for the Lodge, it doesn't matter if the answer is Christ, Buddha, Allah, or even the great mystical frog. As long as he professes some kind of deity, or a supreme being, if you will, his answer will be accepted. This is not only theologically wrong, but is also reasonably absurd. Two different candidates may profess completely opposing faiths, and Masonry is still going to tell them they're both right. This denies a basic philosophic principle of non-contradiction. Either they're both wrong, or one of them is wrong, but they cannot both be right. At this point, the prospect Mason, nearly naked, blindfolded with a noose around his neck, is escorted around the room in a circular fashion multiple times, repeating, I am here of my own will and accord. Now the candidate is brought to the center of the lodge in front of the Masonic altar and is demanded to get down on his knees. On that altar, he will find the compass and square, the symbols of Freemasonry, along with a volume of sacred law. This does not necessarily mean a Bible. It can be a Bible, but it can also be a Koran, a Book of Mormon, a Talmud, or any book labeled as sacred by any religion of the world. If the candidate is a Christian, surely the worshipful master will use a Bible. The candidate now places his hand on the sacred book and swears his commitment to Freemasonry, that he will not reveal the secrets, passwords, handshakes, and rituals of the lodge under penalty of death. It's important to notice that this is an oath, not a mere statement, which means the candidate is obliged to invoke God's name. The language of the Masonic oath says it all.
of having my throat cut across, my tongue torn out, and with my body buried in the sands of the sea at low water mark, where the tide ebbs and flows twice in 24 hours, should I ever knowingly or willingly violate this my solemn obligation of eternal apprentice. So help me God and make me steadfast to keep and perform the same. This is not trivial. Why does the candidate have to bind himself to such an absurd penalty to not reveal secrets that he doesn't even know? Some Masons maintain that this oath is merely symbolic, but there really is no such thing as a symbolic oath. When we swear an oath to God, we are calling Him to be our witness on something we mean to do. In this case, the candidate is committing a mortal sin by swearing an oath of self-curse involving bodily mutilation as well as keeping handshakes and passwords a secret. The Catechism of the Catholic Church on points 2149 and 2150 says, number 2149, oaths which misuse God's name, though without the intention of blasphemy, show lack of respect for the Lord. 2150, the second commandment forbids false oaths. Taking an oath or swearing is to take God as witness to what one affirms. It is to invoke the divine truthfulness as a pledge of one's own truthfulness." End quote. Mortal sin is the greatest tragedy that can happen to a soul, but this particular sin committed against the faith not only kills the life of the Blessed Trinity within the soul, but also carries with it the potential for excommunication. The oath is what separates Masons from non-Masons. After the candidate swears the oath, the noose around his neck is removed, and the worshipful master says that the candidate is bound to us by a stronger tie. With that, the initiation ritual is complete, and the candidate is a Freemason. As we see, the rituals contained within Freemasonry are at best incompatible with Catholicism. They force the inductee to accept and live by an ideology that he doesn't know the details of. In other words, it's like signing a contract before reading the terms. The problem here is that the candidate doesn't have nearly enough information to fully understand what he's getting himself into. An evil organization that portrays itself as good and charitable. How many of us have heard the charitable works of Masonry, but are they really so charitable? One of Masonry's most well-known groups, the Shriners, are celebrated for their philanthropic activities, but according to Salza, they are not as charitable as most people think. There were reports issued uh, and articles written in the 1980s, for example. Uh, one was by Ann Landers. I have a copy of that article. There was also one uh, in Michigan, and, and I think the Michigan Tribune, where it was reported that in uh, the years in the 80s uh, that the shrine gave less than 2%, less than 2% of all of its earnings to charity. The other 98% was used on elaborate temples, on costumes, on rituals, on food, on alcohol. And it is a facade because Masons claim that they're giving all their money to charity. In fact, the Masons claim that they give a million dollars a day to charity. In fact, some claim they give two million dollars a day. They don't know if it's 365 million or 700, 800 million. They're not quite sure, which shows how, how bogus it is. As we can see, the Shriners are not who we think they are. So who are they? The Shriners are an organization of high-level Masons who choose to advance within the Lodge to reach what they call the playground of Freemasonry. Most people don't even know they are Masons and just remember them for their little red fezes and little motor cars. To become a Shriner, a man has to be a Master Mason or a Third Degree Mason and he has to swear an oath, much like the one we just saw. The main difference is that this oath is sworn to Allah on the Koran, regardless of the religion of the candidate, and the ceremony for the ritual will be at a mosque. According to Salza, the reason this oath is sworn on the Koran is to mock the Catholic Church and show the religious indifferentism of Freemasonry. The Shriner's Oath is similar to the Initiation Oath, and it also involves penalties of bodily mutilations and threats of a very painful death should the Mason reveal the secrets of the craft. So, with that being said, Let's move to survey the dangers of Freemasonry in more exact detail.
Masonry does not mix with the Catholic faith, plain and simple. It's incompatible for a variety of reasons. It promotes religious indifferentism, it's naturalistic, it has a certain religiosity to it, it forces members to be secretive, and it blends many different religious beliefs into a unified whole. But hey, don't take our word for it. Let's listen to what John Salza had to say about why Freemasonry is contrary to the Catholic faith. And this is why it has been condemned more than any other error in history, because it attacks the most fundamental precept of our salvation, the necessity to believe in Christ and His Church to be saved. But the popes have gone beyond that, uh, because the popes have said, not only has Masonry rejected revelation, but Freemasonry rejects reason itself. It, object, it, it, it rejects objective truth. And this is because in the Lodge, you can have one man who believes, let's say, in Christ. He professes the Christian faith. But you may have another man believe in the great thumb. Let's say he believes in a false god. Well, in the initiation rite of Freemasonry, the Lodge tells both men that their trust is in God and that their faith is well-founded. So in other words, it rejects reason altogether because if one man's uh, faith is in the true God, uh, and, and only one of them has the true faith, the other man's faith must necessarily be false. It cannot be in the true God. It cannot be well-founded. And yet Freemasonry communicates to both of them that their trust is in God and their faith is well-founded. So the popes have taken this very seriously. They say Masonry not only rejects revelation, but it rejects reason itself. You heard that right. The church has condemned Freemasonry more than any other error in church history. To be exact, the church has authored more than 23 papal condemnations of Freemasonry issued by 12 popes. The church must be pretty serious about Freemasonry to focus on it so much. Now, let's cover those reasons in more detail. First, Freemasonry promotes religious indifferentism, the idea that it's not the duty of man to worship God by believing and practicing the Catholic faith. In other words, Freemasonry declares man to be equally pleasing to God while remaining in any religion. Now, as we covered before, Pope Leo XIII addressed the dangers of indifferentism in his encyclical Humanum Janus. The great error of this age, that a regard for religion should be held as an indifferent matter and that all religions are alike. This manner of reasoning is calculated to bring about the ruin of all forms of religion, and especially of the Catholic religion, which, as it is the only one that is true, cannot, without great injustice, be regarded as merely equal to the other religions. If indifferentism were correct, then there would be no need for Christ to come in the first place. See, indifferentism makes Christ irrelevant, which flies in the face of Jesus and his own words. Christ, the voice of authentic truth, tells us that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one, no one, can come to the Father except through him. And so, given these words, we can see then, obviously, how religious indifferentism is erroneous. Second, Freemasonry is naturalistic, which means that human nature and human reason are the deciders of everything, even morality. Where is God factored into the equation? Well, he isn't, at least the God we know and love. But wait a second, you say, Freemasonry requires members to believe in a supreme being. Well, that's true. However, in Freemasonry, that command ends right there. In turn, the supreme architect of the universe could be anything the God of Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, nature, science, and so forth. Could be any of them. In other words, the word God doesn't have a specific meaning like it does for Catholics. For Masons, that meaning is left up to their own personal beliefs and religious dogma. And what about heaven? If Masons believe in the Great Lodge above, how can you say Freemasonry is naturalistic? Well, according to Masonic teaching, Man can get to heaven on his own accord without the necessary help of Jesus or the Catholic Church, and that's what makes it naturalistic. Let's return to Humanum Janus and hear what Pope Leo had to say about those who support naturalism. 
They care little for duties to God, or pervert them by erroneous and vague opinions, for they deny that anything has been taught by God. They allow no dogma of religion or truth which cannot be understood by the human intelligence, nor any teacher who ought to be believed by reason of his authority. See, naturalism gives birth to ideologies intrinsically opposed in their selves, opposed to Catholicism, such as atheism, scientism, secular humanism, existentialism, and nihilism. But don't take our word for it again. Pope Leo, in his encyclical Humanum Genus, even points to the Freemasons as one of the originators behind the idea of the separation of church and state. He says, quote, By a long and persevering labor, they endeavor to bring about this result, namely, that the teaching office and authority of the church may become of no account in the civil state. And for this same reason, they declare to the people and contend that church and state ought to be altogether disunited. By this means, they reject from the laws and from the commonwealth the wholesome influence of the Catholic religion. And they consequently imagine that states ought to be constituted without any regard for the laws and precepts of the church. It wouldn't take much, therefore, to realize that our world today is heavily influenced by naturalism and we can see the rotten fruits it has given us. For example, abortion, same-sex marriage, euthanasia, contraception, pornography, evils that threaten to send many, many souls to hell. Catholics must reject this opposition because it contradicts the most vital doctrines of the church. It contradicts our Lord. It contradicts our faith. The church's very existence as a religion is essentially based on supernaturalism, theism, divine providence, and divine revelation. It is important to realize that naturalism as a reasonable belief system was roundly defeated centuries ago by the likes of St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Augustine, as well as many other fathers and doctors of the church. Third, Freemasonry is much like a religion. Now, Many modern-day Masons deny this, trying to argue instead that Masonry has no religious roots or underpinnings. But there's a problem here. The founding fathers of Freemasonry, Albert Mackey and Albert Pike, do indeed say it's like a religion. For example, Mackey, in his work Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, states, Look at its ancient landmarks, its sublime ceremonies, its profound symbols and allegories, all inculcating religious observance and teaching religious truth. And who can deny that it is eminently a religious institution? Masonry, then, is indeed a religious institution. And on this ground mainly, if not alone, should the religious Mason defend it. It's hard to argue against a quote like that. If Mackey, who was highly influential in the early days of Freemasonry, is saying it's much like a religion, then why don't Freemasons today view it in the same way? Are they in denial? Our next quote comes from Albert Pike, the only Confederate general, by the way, to have a statue in Washington, D.C. Pike wrote a well-known Masonic book called Morals and Dogma, in which he attests to the religiosity of Freemasonry. Masonry, around whose altars the Christian, the Hebrew, the Muslim, the Brahmin, the followers of Confucius and Zoroaster, can assemble as brethren and unite in prayer to the one God who is above all, Balim. See, there's a blatant religiosity to Freemasonry as the founding fathers indicate. After all, the Masons have temples, altars, worship services, vestments, feast days, a moral code, doctrines, a dogmatic constitution, a hierarchy of leadership, initiation and burial rites, even promises of an afterlife. Sounds a lot like Catholicism, doesn't it? And how could any well-meaning Mason admit otherwise? The church was so worried that Freemasonry would pull well-meaning Catholics from worshiping the one true God to an undefined great architect of the universe that Pope Clement XII issued a papal bull in 1738 forbidding membership in any Masonic organization. Now, 
It has come to our ears that certain societies, called in the popular tongue francs maisons, are spreading far and wide, and men of any religion or sect, satisfied with the appearance of natural probity, are joined together according to their laws and the statutes laid down for them. But a strict and unbreakable bond which obliges them, both by an oath upon the Holy Bible and by a host of grievous punishment to an inviolable silence about all that they do in secret together. We therefore, having taken counsel of some of our venerable brothers among the cardinals of the Holy Roman Church, and also with certain knowledge and mature deliberations, so hereby determine and have decreed that these same societies, or francs maisons, or whatever other name they may go by, are to be condemned and prohibited. And by our present constitution, valid forever, we do condemn and prohibit them. The problem here, as Pope Clement points out, is that Freemasonry forces candidates to serve two masters. It forces candidates to accept a vague idea of God, and it forces candidates to accept a rival magisterium of beliefs. What are the Masonic beliefs? After all, every organization has beliefs. They boil down into these three ideals. First, the idea of brotherly love. Second, charity for others and mutual aid for fellow Masons to the point that they may lie with impunity to protect another Mason or his lodge. Third, the idea of truth or the search for answers to the universal questions of morality and the salvation of the soul. Again, this parallels Catholicism, but yet doesn't even attempt to answer the question, why am I here? These beliefs are so vague as to be destitute of any direction. Another problematic area is the way in which Masons perform their rituals. For example, the cross in Masonic ceremonies is used as merely a symbol of nature and eternal life, devoid of Christ's sacrifice for sin. The cross for Catholic Christians is the victory over sin and eternal death. It is where Jesus reconnected us with the Father. The cross Christ died upon is intrinsically part of our salvation. In the Masonic cross, the very inscription above Jesus' head, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, is replaced by the words, the fire of nature rejuvenates all, meaning the sacred fire's regeneration of mankind, just as the sun regenerates nature in the spring. That's not weird at all, is it? Are you seeing how Freemasons twist and pervert Christianity? Here's another example. Sadly, during the initiation rite, the candidate expresses a desire to seek light and is assured he will receive the light of spiritual instruction that he could not receive in another church and that he will gain eternal rest in the celestial lodge if he lives his life according to Masonic principles. Yeah. What exactly is the light? Well, good question. No exact detail is given other than it is a symbol of spiritual truth and knowledge and that every candidate must discover it in his own fashion. This way of thinking reminds us of the Protestant heresy. You only need faith and you'll make it to heaven. Hey, it doesn't matter if you're a great sinner. You've already accepted Jesus into your life. Repentance? Huh, that doesn't really matter. Heaven is still yours. All you need is faith. Um, question. Where's the justice in that? But wait, it gets worse. Freemasons are not allowed to say the name of Jesus inside the lodge. They don't want to offend anyone. Oh no. What all this boils down to is that Freemasonry simply doesn't embrace the central Christian doctrines of the Trinity, the Fall, the Incarnation, and the Atonement. To the lodge, these essential Christian doctrines are, well, completely irrelevant. Fourth, Freemasonry is riddled with secrecy, blood oaths and rituals, all of this being a rather well-known fact. An oath, for those who don't know, is a religious act asking God to witness the truth of a statement. Now, we must understand that only two organizations in the entire world, for serious reasons, can require an oath, those being the church and the state. As we said before, the person wanting to enter Freemasonry must take a secret oath, under pain of death or self-mutilation if exposed, which of course is utterly contrary to Christian morals. Some Masons will argue that the penalties for exposing the secrets of Freemasonry are symbolic, but the question then becomes if the words have no meaning, why use them in the first place? 
This seems contradictory, doesn't it? What's more, the secret oath is performed when the candidate kneels, blindfolded, in front of the altar, placing both hands on the volume of sacred law, the square and the compass, and repeating after the worshipful master. The peculiar thing is the candidate doesn't know all the secrets to which he's taking an oath, and why all this need for secrets in the first place. Scientology, anyone? See, this is how evil operates. It's constantly trying to hide, confuse, and divide. Now let's take another look at Pope Leo's encyclical, Humanum Genus, where he talks about the clandestine nature of the Masonic sect. When thoroughly understood, they are found still to retain the nature and the habits of secret societies. There are many things like mysteries, which is the fixed rule to hide with extreme care, not only from strangers, but from very many members. Also, such as their secret and final designs, the names of the chief leaders, and certain secret and inner meetings, as well as their decisions and the ways and means of carrying them out. This is, no doubt, the object of the manifold difference among the members as to right, office, and privilege, of the received distinction of orders and grades, and of that severe discipline which is maintained. The overarching point here is indoctrination, and many Masonic authors, even modern-day ones, do not hide this at all. For example, current Masonic author Jay Kinney, who wrote The Masonic Myth, states, the rituals do something more than merely impact lessons or underscore commitment. However, when properly performed, they provide an initiatory experience that can have deep ramifications within the unconscious psyche of the candidate. The rituals impart lessons or teaching that build on each other to provide an orientation in masonry. Each ritual includes an obligation that the candidate must willingly swear to. These obligations largely consist of vows of confidentiality and of a stated intent to abide by Masonic ideals. Now, why indoctrination, you might ask? Because all the candidates come from an ideology of sorts, and this ideology must be broken. It's kind of like military indoctrination. The thought is to reform the candidate or expose him to new ideas in the hope that he will die for these standards in the future. Fifth, the teachings and practices of Freemasonry result in syncretism, or the blending of different religious beliefs into a unified whole. How does Masonry do this exactly? Well, for example, syncretism takes place when men of all creeds gather around a common altar and place all religious writings alongside each other. No one religious text is better than the others, and for that matter, all religious texts are truthful. And thus, all faiths are represented in some way, shape, or form in Masonry, and this can be explicitly seen in the Lodge's prayers, its unique names and symbols for God and Heaven. So, let's further prove that Freemasonry has taken elements from other religions, starting with Christianity, moving then to Judaism, and finally finishing with Islam. First, Masons use passages from the New Testament in their rituals, with of course any reference to Christ being removed. Second, Masons in some circumstances dedicate a lodge to St. John the Baptist or St. John the Evangelist, who are espoused as eminent Christian patrons of Masonry. No kidding. Third, Masons perform their three degrees in spaces or buildings that are meant to represent or symbolize King Solomon's temple. This has obvious connotations to Judaism. Fourth, Masons in the third degree incorporate the many facets of Judaic worship in greeting one another during their day-to-day -day lives. This includes secret handshakes and code words. Fifth, Masons read Old Testament verses for each degree. Sixth, Masons in their rituals to become a shriner meet and perform in mosques and participants wear Islamic vestments and use symbolism such as the scimitar and the crescent. In addition, the former secret passwords of the Shriners were Islamic cities, Mecca, and Medina. So as we can see, Masonry has blended and incorporated many different religions into its organizational practices. In turn, we must reject this idea of syncretism and realize that all other religions are false. Jesus is direct and very specific on this point. He wants us to worship Him and only Him. 
to do anything else is to stray away from the truth, and this we must avoid on peril of our souls. So there you have it, the five reasons why the church thinks Freemasonry is evil and why no Catholic should or can belong to it. But we aren't done yet. Let's look at how our Holy Fathers saw and continue to see Freemasonry from a historical perspective. The pontiffs knew that Masonry leads to a sort of confusion. It confuses the candidate into believing false ideologies, ideologies that could very well endanger his eternal soul. The first time a pope spoke publicly about Freemasonry was all the way back in 1736 when the Inquisition investigated a Masonic lodge in Florence, Italy. The lodge attracted the attention of the Roman Inquisition because certain learned members had, quote, advanced views, views that were incompatible with the church. After the Inquisition finished its investigation, Pope Clement XII issued In Eminite Apostolatus, the first papal prohibition on Freemasonry, where he outright condemned the craft. According to their laws and the statutes laid down for them by a strict and unbreakable bond which obliges them, both by an oath upon the Holy Bible and by a host of grievous punishment to an inviolable silence about all that they do in secret together. As one might imagine, Pope Clement XII was very concerned about how Freemasonry operated and ruled rightly to ban any Catholic from joining such an organization. In later years, the ban on Freemasonry, as laid out in, in Eminite, was reiterated and expanded upon by Benedict XIV in 1751, Pius VII in 1821, Leo XII in 1826, Pius VIII in 1829, Gregory XVI in 1832, Pius IX in 1846, 1849, 1864, 65, 69, and 1873. And of course, Pope Leo XIII's encyclical, Humanum Janus in 1884, where he specifically condemned Freemasonry as well as a number of beliefs and practices associated with the Masonic practice, including naturalism, popular sovereignty, which doesn't recognize God, and the idea that the church and state should be separated. Now, it's important to realize that the thrust of Freemasonry stayed the same throughout the centuries. It wasn't like Freemasonry started off bad and turned into something wholesome. The continual condemnation of Freemasonry by the popes shows that this organization continued and continues to be evil at its core. After all, the Pope doesn't just devote an entire encyclical to one topic for no reason. The next mention of Freemasonry comes to the faithful in the 1917 Code of Canon Law, where it explicitly declares that joining a Masonic Lodge entails automatic excommunication, and not to mention forbidding books that promote Freemasonry. The ban on Freemasonry remains untouched for some 60 years until after the Second Vatican Council, when questions begin to arise as to whether the Church was easing its stance toward Masonry. In 1974, Cardinal Schaper, Prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, sent a private letter to some Episcopal conferences that stated, in part, The Sacred Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith has ruled that Canon 2335 no longer automatically bars a Catholic from membership of Masonic groups. And so, a Catholic who joins the Freemasons is excommunicated only if the policies and actions of the Freemasons in his area are known to be hostile to the Church. This advice unfortunately led some Catholics to believe, mistakenly, that the prohibition was no longer in force and that the Church no longer had objections to Freemasonry. However, the excommunication penalty still stood. The German Bishops Conference was the next body to discuss Masonry. In 1980, the conference produced a report highlighting the problematic nature of Masonic associations. The report covers many points, which include 1. Freemasonry denies revelation and objective truth. 2. Freemasonry espouses religious indifferentism. 3. Freemasonry is deist, it denies the possibility of divine revelation and thus threatening the respect due to the church's teaching office. Four, Freemasonry has a sacramental aspect to it, thereby signifying an individual transformation, resulting 
in an alternative path to perfection and a total claim on the life of that member and so on. The document concludes by stating that all lodges are forbidden to Catholics, including Catholic friendly lodges, and that German Protestant churches were also suspicious of Freemasonry. The next mention of Masonry comes to us in February 1981, where the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith under Cardinal Shaper issued a letter to the United States bishops entitled, Clarification Concerning Status of Catholics Becoming Freemasons, which stated the private letter of 1974 on becoming public had, quote, given rise to erroneous and tendentious interpretations. The clarification went on to affirm the prohibition against Catholics joining Masonic orders. A few years later, in 1983, the Church revised the Code of Canon Law. The new canon, unlike its predecessor, did not explicitly name Masonic orders among the secret societies it condemns. It states, A person who joins an association which plots against the Church is to be punished with a just penalty. One who promotes or takes office in such an association is to be punished with an interdict. This omission has caused some Catholics and Freemasons, especially in America, to believe that the ban on Catholics becoming Freemasons has been lifted. In that same year, 1983, the prefect Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger for the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, our beloved former Pope, with the personal approval of Pope John Paul II, issued a declaration on Masonic associations which reiterated the Church's objections to Freemasonry. It states, the faithful who enroll in Masonic associations are in a state of grave sin and may not receive Holy Communion. The Church's negative judgment in regard to Masonic associations remains unchanged since their principles have always been considered irreconcilable with the doctrine of the Church and therefore membership in them remains forbidden. Just two years later, in 1985, the U.S. Bishops' Committee on Pastoral Research and Practices concluded in its letter to the U.S. Bishops concerning Masonry that The principles and basic rituals of Masonry embody a naturalistic religion, active participation in which is incompatible with Christian faith and practice. The topic of Freemasonry wouldn't be revisited until September 15, 2000, when the Reverend Thomas Anslow, Judicial Vicar of the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Los Angeles, wrote a letter to David Patterson, Executive Secretary of the Masonic Service Bureau of Los Angeles, in response to a question on, quote, whether a practicing Catholic may join a Masonic Lodge, end quote. Father Anslow said that, quote, at least for Catholics in the United States, I believe the answer is probably yes. Father Anslow, however, publicly retracted this letter on February 12, 2002, with the explanation that his analysis was faulty. He said that Freemasonry fostered a, quote, supra-confessional humanitarian conception of the divine that neutralizes or replaces the faith dimension of our relationship with God, close quote. The next mention of Freemasonry came on March 1, 2007, when Archbishop Gianfranco Girotti, the regent of the Apostolic Penitentiary, made a statement that membership in Masonic organizations, quote, remains forbidden to Catholics and called on priests who had declared themselves to be Freemasons to be disciplined by their direct superiors. This declaration was written in response to 85-year-old priest Rosario Francesco Esposito, who had declared himself a Freemason even though he was once commissioned by the Church to study the Church's teachings on Masonry. The most recent discussion regarding Freemasonry came in March of 2013 when the Vatican's Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith removed French priest Father Pascal Vassin's faculties over which him refusing to renounce his role in Freemasonry. So, as you can see, the Church has always spoken with continuity in regard to its opposition with Freemasonry, from its very first prohibition in 1738 to its latest action against a priest who refused to denounce the craft in March of 2013. It follows, then, if you are a Catholic and have had or have membership in any Masonic organization, you must formally leave the craft and make a good, 
holy confession before you can receive our blessed Lord in the Eucharist. If you are a Mason and you are a Catholic, you may not go to Holy Communion. The popes have all agreed that Freemasonry is just plain bad. But now, let's look, look at some of their future plans and see exactly how bad. You've heard a lot of history and beliefs of the Masons, but is there a larger goal that they have in mind for the future? Well, in the 32nd degree rituals, when a candidate is deemed worthy to learn certain so-called truths, the candidate for initiation is told that Masons are to pray for, quote, the universal dominion of the true principles of Masonry and that they will, quote, eventually rule the world. And if you think that's an exaggeration, here again is John Salza, someone who witnessed it firsthand. In fact, I heard those very words when I took the 32nd degree. Uh, remember that we've demonstrated that the errors of, of uh, communism, the errors of Freemasonry are effectively the same. This is what the church has said. Well, uh, that error is the desire to have a one world republic and a one world religion. Where there is no Christianity anymore, the world republic, the world religion is the highest authority. Now, do the Masons who hold pancake breakfasts and raise money for children's hospitals work behind the scenes to take over the world? No. As we said, it's the 32nd degree where a candidate is told of their desire for global control. Monsignor Dillon, author of the trusted source we mentioned earlier, Grand Orient Freemasonry Unmasked, says that the craft's goals are, quote, the destruction of the church and of all forms of Christianity, the obliteration of every kind of supernatural belief, and finally, the removal of all existing human governments and to make way for, and this is important, a universal republic in which the utopian ideas of complete liberty from social, moral, and religious restraint, absolute equality, and social fraternity should reign." Closed quote. Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI was aware that Freemasonry hasn't gone away over the centuries, but is actually gaining greater power in Europe. In a 2011 interview with Cardinal Antonio Canizares, the prefect of the Congregation for Divine Worship, shares Pope Benedict's three greatest fears for the Church. One of those fears is, quote, the ever greater control of Freemasonry on the cultural level and on the centers of power in the European Union, end quote. But it's not just the high levels of Freemasonry that are executing the plan. We know from Pope Leo XIII that there are other sibling groups who share their goals. There are several organized bodies which, though differing in name, in ceremonial, in form and origin, are nevertheless so bound together by community of purpose and by the similarity of their main opinions as to make, in fact, one thing with the sect of the Freemasons, which is a kind of center whence they all go forth and whither they all return. Are there some contemporary groups that share a common purpose with Freemasonry? Many people have written and have documented the fact that the Masons are governing through such organizations as the Bilderberg Society, uh, the Trilateral Commission, the Council on Foreign Relations, all in alliance with the military-industrial complex, which is the U.S. military and our allies, seeking to impose this one world order upon the world. We also have an understanding of what the group's big plans were from another unique source, a book called Tragedy and Hope by Professor Carol Quigley. Quigley, who was a professor of former President Bill Clinton's, was given two years of special access during the 1960s to examine the records of a secret society called the Roundtable Group, a collective which eventually spawned the Council on Foreign Relations and its sibling, the Royal Institute on International Affairs. But before we tell you about these groups and their plans, let's go back and explain where they came from. A Freemason by the name of Cecil Rhodes had a master plan for the world that went far beyond his lifetime. He is the man behind the Rhodes Scholarships, founder of the De Beers Diamond Empire, and is seen by some as architect of racial segregation in South Africa, known as apartheid. 
When Rhodes died in 1902, he left a trust, a series of seven wills with explicit directions attached to them. These wills contained the plans for his great idea, as he called it, which came to him as a young man. You see, on June 2nd, 1877, at the age of 24, Rhodes had an epiphany, and the timing of this epiphany is critical. It came just hours after he became a Freemason at Oxford University. A great idea, as he called it, came to him. The idea was to create a secret society to further the British Empire and, quote, the bringing of the whole uncivilized world under British rule, end quote. Rhodes believed that the British were a vastly superior people and desired that they should one day govern the world. Rhodes no doubt got this idea from a professor at Oxford named John Ruskin. Ruskin, who was an occultist, taught the same idea of British superiority over all others and their eventual rule of the world, which he got from Plato's Republic. But back to Rhodes' vision. It's quite interesting that this epiphany occurred the same day he became a Freemason. Adam Weishaupt, founder of the Illuminati, believed that once a man was enticed into masonry, a great gain for evil was obtained. As we've explained in the past, a Catholic would be immediately excommunicated when he joined Freemasonry, which is not necessarily the case today. However, the soul still loses the grace of God and is in a state of rebellion. Now, while Rhodes wasn't Catholic, we clearly see that entering Masonry has a certain impact on a man's soul, leaving him very susceptible to evil. The story continues. Three months after his entry into the Masons, Rhodes returned to his diamond career in South Africa. One night, he was found in his room, having barricaded himself in there, claiming he had just seen a ghost. Right after this, Rhodes had his confession of faith, along with his last will and testament, legally formalized. While we don't know exactly what happened to him that night, it should be noted that another famous historical leader had similar beliefs of racial superiority and had a similar mystical experience. His name was Adolf Hitler. It involved Hitler being found in a room, swaying back and forth, uttering strange words and broken phrases. Later on, he admitted that he had seen a vision of, quote, the new man, fearless and formidable. I shrank from him, end quote. Shortly after, Hitler founded an order which was dedicated to ruling the world. Sound familiar? Oswald Spengler, the famous German scientist and author of Decline and Fall of Civilization, called the spirit of colonial expansion that possessed both Hitler and Rhodes as demonic. So now that we've explained to you Rhodes' background, let's get back to the Council on Foreign Relations, or the CFR for short, and the Royal Institute of International Affairs. These were just two of the secret societies that Rhodes wanted to set up. They were international branches of what was called the Society of the Elect, which was the inner circle of the secret society. The society was established in 1891 with Rhodes as the leader, with Lord Alfred Milner and others as the executive committee. When Rhodes died, he left the trust and his plans primarily in the hands of Milner. Now at first, a group called Milner's Kindergarten was formed, which consisted of prominent English Freemasons. To expand the influence, other round table groups, named after King Arthur's legendary meeting place, were set up in seven countries, most notably in England and the United States. The actual round table group was hidden, but a front organization existed, kind of like the public face of an organization. In America, the round table was J.P. Morgan and Company, and the front organization was, of course, the Council on Foreign Relations. In Great Britain, it was the original roundtable group formed by Milner and the Royal Institute of International Affairs. This was their public face. These were founded at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919. In 1922, the Council endorsed world government in its journal called Foreign Affairs. In it, the author says, Obviously, there is going to be no peace or prosperity for mankind as long as the Earth remains divided into 50 or 60 independent states and until some kind of international system is created. The real problem today is that of the world government. Now, in 1975, retired Admiral Chester Ward, former judge advocate of the U.S. Navy 
and former CFR member for 20 years, said the following in his book, Kissinger on the Couch. The goal of the CFR is submergence of U.S. sovereignty and national independence into an all-powerful one-world government. This lust to surrender the sovereignty and independence of the United States is pervasive throughout most of the membership. There are many more examples of quotes like this, pointing to the CFR's desire for a one-world government, but you get the idea. Their aims are essentially the same as Freemason Cecil Rhodes. Rhodes desired a world under British rule. The CFR desires a world under the rule of the elite. The U.S. government is filled with CFR members, and it's stated that the council gives a lot of advice to the federal government. Here's CFR member and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton confirming the strong link between the two organizations. We get a lot of advice from the council, so this will mean I won't have as far to go to uh, be told uh, what we should be doing and uh, how uh, we should uh, think about the future. We spoke about the CFR as an organization, but who are some of its 4,000 members? Well, here are the names of a few current members that you might recognize. Former President Bill Clinton, actor Warren Beatty, New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg, former NBC anchor Tom Brokaw, former Vice President Dick Cheney, actor George Clooney, TV personality Katie Couric, former Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich, former Fed Chairman Alan Greenspan, Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel, former University of Notre Dame President Theodore Hesburgh, Caroline Kennedy, Secretary of State John Kerry, Senator John McCain, former CBS News anchor Dan Rather, Condoleezza Rice, David Rockefeller, Charlie Rose, Diane Sawyer, billionaire George Soros, broadcast journalist and television personality Barbara Walters. Next is the Bilderberg Group, an annual meeting of about 125 persons from Western Europe and America who are some of the world's most powerful people. They discuss political, environmental, economic, and strategic issues facing the West. The group was formed in 1954 by individuals with more than a passing interest in the craft. The late co-founder and former Nazi, Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands, was married to Queen Juliana of the Netherlands, who holds the Masonic title, the Protectress of the Craft, for her support of Freemasonry. Polish politician Joseph Reitinger, the other co-founder, was a 33rd degree Freemason. The following quote was retrieved from the 1991 Bilderberg meeting in which David Rockefeller, a key member, said, We are grateful to the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine, and other great publications whose directors have attended our meetings and respected their promises of discretion for almost 40 years. It would have been impossible for us to develop our plan for the world if we had been subjected to the lights of publicity during those years. But the world is more sophisticated and prepared to march towards a world government. The supranational sovereignty of an intellectual elite and world bankers is surely preferable to the national auto-determination practiced in past centuries. As you can see, both of these groups, the CFR, the Council on Foreign Relations, and the Bilderberg, desire a one-world government. And as we've seen, both have strong, if not direct and indirect, ties to Freemasonry. For all of this to happen, the Catholic Church has got to go. And of course, there's the group that are most likely familiar with, the United Nations. First, a brief history of the UN. Its forerunner was called the League of Nations. It was established right after World War I. 42 nations banded together in hopes of keeping the peace and preventing the devastation that the First World War had caused. When World War II began, it became obvious that the League of Nations had failed and it disbanded. Towards the end of the Second World War, a new attempt was made at bringing together nations of the world to keep the peace. This was called, of course, the United Nations. Formed in 1945, it used the basic blueprint from the League of Nations with some modifications and had 51 countries as members. Over its 60-plus year history, the UN has concerned itself with many of the world's issues – war, poverty, human rights, etc. The addressing, in addressing these issues, the United Nations works to implement what are called soft laws. These are declarations, agreements, resolutions that are not binding between countries, but can eventually evolve into international law. 
An example of a UN trade agreement that is binding on countries and has reduced American sovereignty is the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA. According to former Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, treaties like this actually supersede American law. In a 1952 speech to the American Bar Association, Dulles said, quote, They are more supreme than ordinary laws. Treaty laws can override the Constitution. They can cut across the rights given to the people by their Constitutional Bill of Rights, something not many folks know. This is the Freemasonic plot, part of Cecil Rhodes' vision, to eventually destroy all national sovereignty and introduce a one-world government. So, the more the United Nations attempts to enact treaties, the more the United States and other nations lose their independence and are under UN authority. Obviously, there's a lot to absorb here, but one thing is certain. Freemasonry is the enemy of Christ, His Church, and men and women of goodwill. If you're a Catholic and are involved in Freemasonry, a standard letter of resignation from the craft can be found at our website, churchmilton.tv. John Salza also offers us some resources. I've written two books on Freemasonry. The first is called Masonry Unmasked, uh, and it's uh, an insider reveals the secrets of a lodge. Uh, this has been written for a more general audience. Uh, it appeals to Christians, but even to non-Christians who've read this book. They, they, uh, they realize that what Freemasonry is teaching is incompatible with their individual religious faith. And so this was the first book I've written on Freemasonry. It goes through all of the rituals in, in a lot of detail. It gets into the ancient pagan mystery religions. It gets into the teachings of the church. Uh, in this book, uh, I cite the 23 separate condemnations of Freemasonry issued by 12 different popes on the matter. Uh, and I have other uh, resources in here for you uh, uh, to learn from. The other book is called Why Catholics Cannot Be Masons. This, of, of course, as the title suggests, was written uh, from a Catholic perspective, primarily for Catholics, for priests, for bishops, for religious, explaining uh, just why Masonry is incompatible with the faith. And I walk through what happens specifically in the initiation rite of Freemasonry. And you can uh, get all these books at my website, uh, scripturecatholic.com. That is www.scripturecatholic.com. And on that website, I will also mention that I have transcribed all of the Masonic rituals of the three degrees of Freemasonry. I had to memorize a couple hundred pages uh, in, in doing so because all of the rituals are written in, an, in a secret ciphered format. I have them all in plain ling uh, English uh, for uh, uh, the viewers to go through and to see exactly what Freemasonry teaches. And that again is on my website at scripturecatholic.com. And for those of you who have relatives or friends in Freemasonry who, for whatever reason, choose to remain within the ranks of the craft, you might consider visiting our site to print out a copy of a special prayer. O Lord Jesus Christ, who showest forth thine omnipotence most manifestly when thou sparest and hast compassion, thou who didst say, pray for those who persecute and calumniate thee, we implore the clemency of thy sacred heart on behalf of souls made in the image of God, but most miserably deceived by the treacherous snares of Freemasonry, and going more and more astray in the way of perdition. Let not the church, thy spouse, any longer be oppressed by them, but appeased by the intercession of the Blessed Virgin, thy mother, and the prayers of the just. Be mindful of thy infinite mercy, and, disregarding their perversity, cause these very men to return to thee, that they may bring consolation to the church by a most abundant penance, make reparation for their misdeeds, and secure for themselves a glorious eternity. Who livest and reignest, world without end. Amen. Finally, we'd like to leave you with a few takeaway points. One, there are three degrees of Masons, Entered Apprentice, Fellow Craft, and Master Mason. After Mason reaches the third level of Master Mason, he can choose to follow either the Scottish Rite or the York Rite. For the most part, these are the two main rites. Number two, most regular folks and most Freemasons themselves think Freemasonry is just a boys club that does some charity work and has a few secret passwords and handshakes. But 
Freemasonry espouses the heresy of indifferentism, which is the belief that all religions are equal and it really doesn't matter what you believe because each one is a path to heaven. This essentially brings down our blessed Lord, the second person of the blessed Trinity, to the level of Buddha, Muhammad, etc. Number three, once a Catholic man takes the Masonic oath, he has possibly severed his relationship with the Catholic Church, whether he knows it or not. The Masonic oath he takes re replaces any profession of faith he has made to Catholicism or Christianity. Number four, Freemasonry has been condemned by 12 different popes in 23 different writings. 12 different popes in 23 different writings, the most important being Humanum Janus, penned by Pope Leo XIII. Number five, Freemasonry desires to, as they say in their rituals, eventually rule the world. This world will be communist, pantheist, and with the eventual goal of destroying belief in the one true God. There's just not enough room in this world for both Freemasonry and the Catholic Church. They are in a struggle to the death, and we need every last Catholic in the battle. Please pray for our holy, one, holy Catholic Apostolic Church and for the defeat of Freemasonry. God love you. I'm Michael Voris. Thank <laughs> you.